Um, my first question is in relation to Ireland's current hospital bed occupancy. What is it at this, this stage? Given that the EU average is 63, um, I'm just curious what, where we're at in Ireland. Uh, thanks very much, Deputy. I might ask, uh, Damien, do you have that, the occupancy rates? I don't have the exact right. figures, but what I would have is the range, Deputy. So it would range from the sort of high 80s up into, but this changes obviously week to week, uh, into the early hundreds, uh, perhaps at periods of surge. So it would vary across sites, and it would also vary at, at particular time periods of pressure. So you'd have to look at it over a period. But we, I could provide figures if it's helpful in terms of so looking back. So probably a ballpark, a ballpark figure is probably 80 plus percent. Absolutely, yeah, it would, would be high. It would be in the high, I would say in the 90s in um, terms of figures. Oh, okay. There. And would that be deemed kind of dangerous in relation to normal kind of occupancies? Certainly very high occupancy levels, certainly unsafe. Uh, and uh, the advice is on any uh, functioning hospital system to keep it at 85% or less. Uh, but during periods of surge, as Damien said, we find that we have, uh, we're occupying uh, we, with people coming in through unscheduled care occupy beds designated for other purposes and as we all know somebody from the meeting here today occupy uh, trolleys as well. It's a function not just um, of bed capacity but also how beds are used. A length of stay for example nationally is six days and also a function perhaps of the existence or otherwise of alternatives such as community services particularly for those who are most in needs, uh, need of our services. When you look at our, our urgent emergency departments even though um, uh, older people over 65 comprise a minority of presentations that, that comprise a majority of admissions. So um, how we provide services and alternatives to the people who, who are the, the main groups attending is, uh, is another, another um, influencing factor on, on the occupancy. Okay. There is as well, Deputy, there's an IGIS report uh, that came out in the last few months on bed occupancy within uh, the public hospitals. We'll forward it on to you and to the committee members. Yeah. And to obviously get it down to the EU average of 63%, it would take enormous amount of capacity, you would think. Now, obviously, there's as challenges in relation to how long people are staying in you know, hospital settings, but to get it down to 63%, that's, that's some undertaking. I, I, I might take this, Deputy. The, um, the, I, I'm open to correction on this, but, but I think that this launch of care target was 80% from, from memory. I think, I, I think that, that that was looked across Europe and 80% was seen as a, or I sorry, beg your pardon, uh, yeah, was seen as a, a decent level. I'm, I'm seeing here that the OECD level is about 85%. So we're regularly in the high 90s. The current situation is not sustainable. So. The targets set out, there was the 2018 capacity review, which you'll be aware of, and that had a very wide range if in, a, in a no reform scenario in excess of additional 7,000 beds being required. In a full reform scenario, I think it was about two and a half, 2,400, I think, beds required. Um, we're, we are, the, so the government plan was to add beds in line with the low number on that, which I think was the 2,400. Now, the good news is, um, by the time COVID arrived, that, that target was being met in terms of, I think, about a 13, 14 year uh, increase in beds. We've significantly increased the rate at which we're adding through COVID. So we're now well ahead of the 2018 report and the government position, which is we need to we need the, the 2,400 beds. We're now about halfway. I think uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're now about halfway actually between the no reform and the full reform scenario. However, my view and the view of the department and the HSC is that we have to review that 2018 report. Demographics have changed. Our population has increased. My suspicion is that that report might have lowballed the number of beds we need. So hence, even though we've added nearly a thousand, we now have the accelerated plan for another 1,500 on top of that. And in parallel to that, there's, there's long-term planning going on. We've got the National Children's Hospital coming, we have the National Maternity Hospital, the elective hospitals, uh, and, and, uh, and, and so on. Mr. Just in your statement, you mentioned that you visited many emergency departments, you know, in the recent times, and you said that you know some of it was quite distressing um, for obviously patients and you know staff and families and so forth. What did actually you? What did you actually see that made you know 
you distressed. You know, and obviously we've all been in situations where being in ED departments that was, you know, I know staff are doing absolutely their best, but certain circumstances just not acceptable where people are just lying in trolleys for days in, in some cases. But what did you actually see that made you so distressful? Thanks for the question, Deputy. A combination of things. In, in some of the hospitals, in some of the ED wards, um, long corridors where patients are on trolleys down those corridors where they're not meant to be. These are meant to be corridors where, you know, people walk or, 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 or you know, go tr tr transit through. Um, I've seen cases, and the HICWA reports point this out regularly, where uh, patients are being denied the dignity that they need. So patients waiting on trolleys, and particularly people who might have been, you know, particular injuries or particularly older people, people who are more vulnerable, um, they're in a compromised state. And they're in a state that, that they must be afforded dignity, they must be afforded privacy. And in some of our hospitals, particularly, for example, during the, the, that January surge, uh, I saw elderly patients in situations whereby they, they, they needed their own bay, they needed privacy, um, and they, didn't, they couldn't get it. And I thank you for your, your point. This is not the fault of the healthcare professionals providing the care. The healthcare professionals are under intense pressure. So there's a, there's a human dignity aspect to it, and there's a, there's a comfort aspect to it, particularly when somebody is in. And, and there's more than that, and Dr. Henry can speak to this in, in far better than but I ever can. How can but we stop that? I mean, obviously you don't want to, and you, anybody in this room does not want to see situations like that, but how do you stop it to not be in a kind of, you know, a situation that just constantly goes on? You, that's the, that's the, the seminal question. You, it, at its most basic, you stop it by doing two things. You expand the permanent capacity in our public health workforce at a record level, and you reform our public health service in line with universal health care, in line with the reforms called for in Sláinte Care. Um, what does that mean? It means a massive investment in community-based care in the National Ambulance Service to keep people out of the emergency departments in the first place, a massive investment in general practice to keep people out. Uh, you invest in discharge options, so short-term beds, home care provision, um, and you also have to reform the way that patients are cared for, the, the, the patient flow within the hospitals. So we must, for example, have more senior decision makers available. They must have access to diagnostics. Uh, they must have access to health and social care professionals. They must have access to discharge options. And so, essentially, that's everything we're doing in order to achieve universal health care, and this is, this is a core element of that, really, really boils down to two things. A massive investment in capacity, workforce, e-health, beds, theatres, community-based care, etc., in line with a fundamental reshaping of how we deliver care, in line with Sláinte Care, to deliver it in people's homes, in the community, in general practice, uh, and then only when necessary in the hospitals. Okay. Um, just my final questions in relation to waiting times, and obviously this is, I think, one of the pinch, point, pinch points in the whole health service. Um, and I've said uh, many, many times, the Irish public health system is a really, really good system once you get into it. But the main thing is getting into it. And obviously waiting, kind of, waiting times for, in, in certain instances, a couple of years, it's just not good enough uh, because intervention is key. And obviously, 10 to 12 week waiting times, you know, to cut that down to that is extremely ambitious. But obviously, that's where we want to get at. Um, how ambitious is it? Is it possible in relation to, you know, your time frame as a health minister mm. to get it down to that period of time? And particularly around other pinch points in relation to waiting times around. Um, speech and language therapy around, you know, uh, OT kind of supports. I know them lists are very, very, very lengthy. So how do you address them in your kind of tenure as health minister? Thanks, Deputy. Uh, I, I believe that probably for the first time ever, we can now see 
universal healthcare is a reality in our country. There's three simple tests. Um, for me, it's one of the most important unfinished projects of our republic and must be the cornerstone of any decent society is universal healthcare. There's three tests. Is it, is it affordable for patients? And you'll be aware we're radically reducing costs for patients. Secondly, are the services there and are they good services? And to your point, I think we all agree the services are excellent and you'll be aware we're adding a lot of new services in the community and in the hospitals that patients need. So I think on that second test, we're moving really quite quickly. The third test is the biggest, which is access, which is really what today is about. Access to scheduled care, so the waiting lists, and access to unscheduled care, so uh, your GP or a minor injury unit or an emergency department or out-of-hours uh, doctors. Um, it's a huge task, but critically, we're really beginning to see the waiting lists fall. So the, the targets we're all signed up to, the 10 to 12-week targets, um, have fallen by about 25,000 people just in the last four weeks. Um, from the peak of COVID to the end of last year, they fell by 150,000. 150,000 less men, women and children waiting longer than those agreed targets. Um, that's really important progress. Now, there's still about nine, uh, sorry, 495,000. Um, the aim in the waiting list plan for this year is to get that down by about 10%. We'll get it further if we can. It's fallen, my numbers will be slightly wrong, Deputy, apologies, but it's fallen by, I think, over 20% from the COVID peak already. So this is what we're doing. We're, 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 our healthcare professionals, that m my department, the HSE, are mobilized around short-term short -term measures. Um, and, and at the same time, Dr. Henry, um, is, is leading a really important structural change around uh, this 43 million allocated in recurrent funding, which, which Dr. Henry is working across the system with Damien and with others to put in place new pathways of care. So for example, uh, in the program for government, and it may well have been referenced in Sláinte Care, there's a Sligo ophthalmology pilot that was really good. Sir? There was an ophthalmology, an, 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 there was an ophthalmology pilot project in Sligo oh. that essentially just made it much quicker for patients to get the care they needed. It used opticians more and, and, and used their skill set more than is typically used. That's one of the programs that Dr. Henry is rolling out. We're aiming on having seven of them correct me if I'm wrong, I think seven of them fully completed this calendar year, which is going to make a big difference. And I think the team are starting an additional 23. So, so we're doing a lot of short-term things in terms of the waiting list action plan, but just as importantly, we have to have integrated care. We have to have all of our health care. Yeah. We have to use our Minister. pharmacists and our opticians Minister. and our dentists to the fullest extent of their, their, their license. And so a lot of the work we're doing is around that as well. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh,